eu vou ficar olhando aqui na aba do canal, né? E quando tiver aparecido lá tudo o que, aí eu sinalizo para começar e eu desligo meu microfone. Tá bom, aí tu me dá um vou toque aí na hora que eu puder começar. Vou atualizar aqui. É, Beatriz, eu acho que já está ao vivo lá no canal, só que está ainda aparecendo só o plano de fundo mesmo, né? Ainda não estamos aparecendo. É, só lembrando que talvez tenha um, um delay, né? Um pequeno delay. Eu coloquei para ficar logo... É, não ter delay, né? Porque o, a opção que ele dava era de 30 segundos ou um minuto. Então, eu achei muito grande. É, Israel, você já está aparecendo lá no canal. É, se você puder dizer um oi, só para a gente ver aqui o, o áudio. Ok. Alô? Eu creio que você já pode começar. Ok. Dear professors, students, presenters, members of the organizing committee, my name is Israel Noletto, and on behalf of the Federal University of BOE, the Language and Literature Postgraduate Program and its Students' Union, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first BOE Iowa conference. BOE Iowa Conference, Emerging Theories and Practice, is a joint initiative of professors and students from both master's and doctor's degrees of the Federal University of PoE's Language and Literature Postgraduate Program and Professor Gelbaha Beckett from the Applied Linguistics and Technology Program of the Iowa State University in the United States of America. This conference aims to provide the academia and professional community with a multinational, multilingual environment to share research focused on language and literature through panels, oral presentations and more. We are expecting an active and engaging conference and are looking forward to learning from our key note speakers as well as all the other participants. During these two days of conference, I'd like to invite you to feast your eyes and ears with such captivating topics as critical thinking with project-based learning, why and how, academic writing in other languages in the PPGEL program, challenges and perspectives, slam poetry in times of dystopia, resistance and social belonging, internationalization in higher education, critical literacy and language teaching education, and teaching Shakespeare and other terrifying texts, a simple technique at the nexus of literature and linguistics, and much more. These talks will be given by a diverse team of professionals from Brazil, United States, United Kingdom, and China. As of this moment, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following key figures of the Federal University of POE, who played an active role in the re realization of this conference, after which I will turn the floor to them so that they can talk to us briefly. Professor Francisco Alves Filho, professor from the Language and Literature Postgraduate Program of the Federal University of BOE. Professor Beatriz Gama Rodriguez, professor from the, the Language and Literature Postgraduate Program of the Federal University of BOE. Professor Luiz e. G. Oliveira, Professor and Coordinator of the Language and Literature Postgraduate Program of the Federal University of Piauí, and Professor Regilda Saraiva dos Reis Moreira Araújo, Professor and Head of the Postgraduate and Research Department of the Federal University of Piauí. Now it's my pleasure to turn the floor to Professor Francisco Alves, who will briefly talk to us. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Eu gostaria de dar as boas-vindas a todas as pessoas que vão participar desse evento. E eu gostaria de saudar e cumprimentar, valorizando muito, 
a iniciativa dos discentes do nosso programa. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all, and I'd like to highlight the importance of this initiative by the students of the Language and Literature Graduate Program at UFP. É, eu estou na função de coordenador geral do evento, mas por uma questão administrativa, pela impossibilidade dos alunos acessarem todo o sistema administrativo. Entretanto, a coordenação, por favor. I am coordinating all this project because um, students cannot do it at the university, so I'm I'm the head of this event as a uh, just to fulfill the administrative function. Entretanto, os coordenadores efetivos desse programa são os discentes do nosso programa que foram liderados pelo Josivan Nascimento, que está aqui interpretando, inclusive, a minha fala. Então, eu gostaria realmente de valorizar imensamente iniciativas desse tipo levadas a cabo por discentes dos programas de pós-graduação. So I'd like to highlight that the most important leaders of this project are the students of the program. So I, I thank you all. Uh, in name of Joseph Nascimento, who is interpreting my speech to you in English. E para finalizar, é, quero destacar a importância também da proposta de um evento multilingüe. Essa é a primeira experiência no nosso programa e creio que será uma experiência valorosa e muito importante e que terá novas e novas edições. I also highlight the importance of this event happening in bilingual version. I think that this is the first experience of this kind of event at our program. So this is very important to for the internationalization of research in the academia. Sejam todos bem-vindos e bem-vindas e tenhamos um excelente evento. Uh, welcome you all and have you all a great evening. And thank you, Professor Francisco, for your kind words. Now I'd like to turn the floor to Professor Beatriz Gama Rodriguez. Good morning, everybody. It's a great honor for me to be here. I'm very, very happy to be here because this is a program from, this is an event from our program and I'm proud of that. And as Professor Chico has said, this was uh, an initiative from our students, from our postgraduate students. And that's the biggest happiness for all of us. So we really appreciate all the effort that these students, these postgraduate students have done in order to have this event. And we'd like to welcome all of you who have come here to participate to share with us knowledge, to share with us your scientific results, as this is so important, especially nowadays with all the problems uh, international societies are facing. And as uh, it was also mentioned, it's very important to say that this event is done in a plurilingual or multilingual way. This way we are trying to encourage, again, the sharing of knowledge. We are trying to encourage new partnerships. We want our students to feel that they can do that as they are doing that. So we hope that this event is the first one, but not the last one, and that we may have other events like this at our program, at our university, in a way to share what we are doing, not only here in POE, in o Brazil, and in other countries. So I'd like to welcome all of you again and really hope we have a great and successful event. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Beatriz Gama, for your most beautiful words. And now I'd like to turn the floor 
to Professor Luizy de Oliveira. Good morning, you all. Uh, on behalf of the Language and Literary Studies, Postgraduate Studies uh, of University of Federal University of POE, I would like to welcome you all to our POE Iowa conference uh, on language and literature, emerging theories and practices. A conjoint initiative of Iowa State University, especially Professor Gurbaha Beckett and our students. Uh, we, 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 we want to emphasize the initiative of our students in organizing this event, and we are very proud of the results they have reached so far. Uh, so, uh, reinforcing also that uh, this initiative uh, has also a partnership with the coordination of the program, the faculty, and students from uh, University of POE, Federal University of POE, and other uh, uh, institutions in Brazil and abroad. Uh, our main uh, objective is the sharing of different expertise. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to listening to all your, the results of your researches that will be presented to, today and tomorrow. Uh, we have two very intense days. Uh, and uh, we have participants, uh, students, attendees from Brazil, as well as from other countries, uh, emphasizing Bangladesh, China, Colombia, the United States, the yeah, United Kingdom, and also elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, the event will be held mainly in English, but uh, we'll have also uh, lectures and panels in Portuguese or Spanish, as my own, my own conference later will be. Uh, and uh, our main target are the students. So despite using uh, English as perhaps the key language, the main language uh, all through the event, uh, we also want that our students who still do not feel comfortable enough to present in English uh, that can also have this experience listening uh, and also uh, uh, this exchange between English and other languages just like Portuguese and Spanish mainly. Uh, we are very proud to have uh, this partnership with the Iowa State University and uh, we welcome you all, we thank you all for your interest and for coming into our event and we are sure that it will be very successful from today to tomorrow so thank you all welcome and i know that everybody is looking forward to listening to the dr Bubahar beckett so those are my words for you thank you and thank you professor louise i'd like to thank you wholeheartedly for your most captivating words as usual. Now I'd like to turn the floor to Professor Rijilda Saraiva dos Reis Moreira Araújo, head of the Postgraduate and Research Department of the Federal University. She will be talking in Portuguese and I will translate her speech for her. Professor Rijilda, please. Bom dia a, a todas e a todos. É um grande prazer que me encontro nessa sala virtual, de, participando dessa solenidade de abertura é, deste evento, representando aqui o magnífico reitor, professor Judas Guedes, e representando a Pró-Reitoria de Pós-Graduação da Universidade Federal do Piauí. Good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to be here in this virtual room, representing both the rector of the University of POE, Federal University of POE, Professor Gildasio, and also the research and postgraduate department of the Federal University of POE. Saudações ao professor Luiz de Oliveira, coordenador do projeto e coordenador do programa de pós-graduação em letras, a professora Beatriz Gama, ao professor Francisco Alves, ao Israel Noleto, que está aqui e apresenta também discentes do programa, como também o José do Nascimento. Então, é, é, saudações a todos vocês e 
Espero que esse evento seja bastante produtivo. I'd like to solemnly greet Professor Luizy, Professor Francisco, Professor Beatriz, Josevan, and myself, Israel Maletto. And I expect this event to be very productive and instructive. Este evento é, representa o início, com certeza, da internacionalização do programa de pós-graduação em letras da UF. E nós na administração atual, temos esse compromisso de promover a internacionalização dos programas. Nós estamos com dois compromissos muito importantes, promover a internacionalização e promover a interiorização. Então, nós precisamos internacionalizar e precisamos interiorizar também a pós-graduação. Então, é, é, isso representa uma missão que, à frente da Proreitoria, nós queremos iniciar que já, já há muito tempo tem esse desejo e essa necessidade. Nós chegamos a um nível que estamos aptos a fazer isso. I understand this event represents the kickstart of the internalization of the language and literature postgraduate program of the Federal University of Piauí. We have reached such a standard of quality that the internationalization of our postgraduate programs is our mission and our objective. But also, in addition to the internationalization, we intend to promote a, an interiorization of the programs, um, advancing the quality both abroad and also inside the country. Quero parabenizar aos discentes que organizaram esse evento, que tiveram a iniciativa da realização deste evento, é, dizer que fiquei muito feliz em saber que contamos aqui com, a, com participação de, é, de pesquisadores, é, discentes, docentes, inscritos de várias regiões do país e também é, dos Estados Unidos, da China, do Reino Unido, da Colômbia. Então, eu quero parabenizar por terem conseguido é, é, inici é, iniciar essa, esse processo e contando com o apoio dos docentes para que fosse realizado. I'd like to congratulate the students for their initiative and effort in realizing this conference, involving researchers from different parts of the country and also from overseas people from Colombia, from China, and other countries. And I'd also like to congratulate the professors for helping out their students in this endeavor. E aproveito também para cumprimentar a todos que estão, a todos os docentes e discentes, a todos que estão nos acompanhando né, e que irão assistir no YouTube a conferência. É dizer que a Proreitoria de Pós-Graduação, a, a Universidade Federal do Piauí, é, apoia e está à disposição para ajudar no que for necessário para que essa internacionalização ocorra e a todas essas demandas que virem é, dos programas, que virem do nosso corpo de docentes e discentes. And I'd like to take this opportunity to also congratulate everybody else involved in this initiative and to say that the uh, postgraduate department supports any initiatives of internationalization and is eager to help in any way possible to make this become a reality. Duas boas-vindas à, à professora conferencista de hoje, né, professora Gobon Becker, da Iowa State University. É, a todos os pesquisadores e docentes que aceitaram participar deste evento e contribuir com as suas palestras, conferências, com certeza é, são momentos rios de troca de aprendizado, de informações e de intercâmbio. I'd also like to welcome Professor Gilbert Beckett for being the first keynote speaker of this event and all the other researchers from around the world who accepted the invite to participate and exchange their knowledge in this event.
Então, boas-vindas a todos, um excelente evento. Muito obrigada é, por é, nos convidar para fazer parte desse momento tão importante para o Programa de Pós-Graduação em Letras da UFIP e para a nossa Universidade Federal do Piauí. Um, uma boa, um, um excelente evento. So welcome everyone to this event and thank you for inviting me as a representative of the postgraduate program, oh, sorry, department, and also the Federal University of Piauí. And I welcome everybody else. And I know this is a very important moment for both the university and the postgraduate program. And I wish you all an excellent and engaging conference today. Well, thank you, Professor Hijuda, for your words. And it is now my pleasure to officially open the works of the first POE Iowa conference by turning the floor now to our next chairman, Professor Adriano de Alcântara Oliveira Souza, who is a doctoral candidate at the Language and Literature Postgraduate Program of the Federal University of Piauí who will introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Gilbaha Beckett. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Israel introduced me, my name is Adriano de Alcântara. I am a postgraduate student uh, in the language field of studies, and I am going to introduce Professor Gilbaha Beckett uh, according to a link that she off kindly offered, uh, saying that her master's degree was taken in the Queen's University and the PhD is from the University of British Columbia. She is a professor of TESL and Applied Linguistics, focusing uh, on ba project-based second and foreign language acquisition and socialization, content-based second and foreign language, especially with English as a medium of instruction and learning, uh, second in minority language policies, uh, technology-integrated teaching and learning, and academic literacies. Her uh, studies have many publications, including books, chapters, and articles in different journals, such as the Review of Educational Research, Language Policy, TISO Quarterly, the Modern Language Journal, the Canadian Modern Language Review, the English Language Teaching Journal, TESL, Canada Journal, Journal of Research on Computing and Education, Distance Education, Compare, a Journal of Comparative and International Education, Journal of Mixed Method Research and Applied Measurement in Education. She has also obtained various grants and fellowships totaling over 2 million to the university. Uh, additionally, she has chaired and supervised numerous doctoral dissertations and master's thesis and projects. She is an associate editor of Diaspora, Indigenous, and Minority Education Journal for the editor Rotledge. So, also an integrant of the Iowa State University Language Department. Uh, it's an honor to have her presentation as a keynote speaker, and we are going to wait a little for her to prepare herself while she's doing that. Okay? Adriano. Oui. I think that Guba Beckett haven't joined the room yet, so yes, she has. I think that we may. 
I have sent her uh, an email. Actually, I just sent her another email asking her if she's having any problem with connection or maybe with the link. So mm -hmm. I have sent it again. I hope uh, she's not having any problem. If she is, I am here to help. Okay, so maybe we can stay in standby while she join and we come back as much as possible. <laughs> So if you are watching us uh, on YouTube, so be patient, please, and we will come back very soon. Good morning, everyone, once again. Well, apparently, Professor Beckett is facing some problems and she has not been able to connect so far. So we have prepared a backup plan and I am going to start presenting. Uh, of course, it is not the same topic and the same presentation as Professor Beckett uh, was supposed to give, but I am going to uh, work on what I am studying and, of course, on the perspective that I am studying about critical literacies uh, in the perspective that focuses on the South America, South and Latin America in general, the global South. Okay, I am going to start presenting uh, the topics they are similar in this way because they focus on the critical thinking, on critical perspectives, though the perspective is different as my perspective is about the global south and the colonial studies, okay? So I am going to start presenting with this image and the title that I start that I decided to talk about is Global South and the Colonial Studies Towards Critical Literacies and Teacher Education. As I believe that most people who are here are interested in teacher education, so we can uh, develop ourselves as professionals and of course thinking on thinking critically especially on times of instability of political instability economic instability and uh, many other problems we may face uh, so i start presenting with this image in which you can see the latin america map that is upside down and you can see the south pole on the top of it Right. As you can see, this change means a lot 
the Ecuador line going to the bottom, it doesn't simply reorientate the line, but simply gives a different perspective of everything. Putting the South on the top means let's give the South a voice. Let's make the global South uh, able to speak and produce knowledge, produce content. But for us to start there, I organized my speech beforehand working on presenting the main uh, authors and scholars who work and study on this area, on this field. Uh, we have in Latin America in general, Professor Walter Mignolo and Arturo Escobar. We also have Anibal Quijano and Enrique Dussel, who are uh, in the, on the top, on the head of the Giro de Colonial, that is one of the main uh, focuses of the project of the colonial studies, having this shift, and also Catherine Walsh, who is also a very important scholar who has, has had experiences with Paulo Freire, uh, with critical pedagogies and all. Besides those, we have uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres and Maria Lugones, who face the ideas, who created and shaped uh, the concepts of uh, about feminism and different kinds of beings, of uh, the coloniality of being. We have uh, Santiago Castro Gomes and Ramon Grossfugel. As you see, the most of them, they are related to South America. So this is the main focus. This is where we part from, okay? But in Brazil, we also have people who study that. We also have scholars who are really much involved on it. We have Professor Tânia Rezende, who is special, especially devoted to work on indigenous peoples and indigenous cultures. We have professors Juliana Martinez and Professor Clarissa Jordão, who work at the Federal University of Paraná, and Rosane Pessoa and Professor Limário, who work also on the colonial studies and all. We didn't have the time to put here all of the scholars from Brazil, but we have many other names, important names to mention, like Valkyria Montemor, uh, Kleber Aparecido, and many others, okay? So for us to start brainstorming about these questions that make give us this feeling of unrest, we can think of these questions. Is the world we live a fair place? Do all people have access to job opportunities? What about education, soap, drinkable water? If we think of the pandemic times we have been facing, do all people have the same uh, access to education? Uh, people say all the time that we need to wash our hands and to use uh, alcohol in our hands and in everything that we touch. Uh, but do people even have access to soap? Do people have access to drinkable water? Uh, another question is, what is it to live in a society in which there are so little with a lot of power and there are a lot of people who are powerless. So these questions, they make us start thinking, uh, is there any way to change this reality? Because we can think of many different realities, right? Not only one, but different universes, different realities in general. OK, so my speech is organized talking about the colonial studies and the critical literacies. As you can see, both arrows are going to collide. In one point, they are going to face each other. They are going to be connected one another. To start commenting about the decolonial studies, I decided to start with a short history class so we can think of what is modernity and how it has uh, ended up 
on the globalization uh, process. Uh, the differences between colonialism and coloniality, which is a very central concept distinction, uh, what is it to decolonize, and also talking about the giro descolonial, which is really important, differences about epistemology and ontology in the colonial studies, uh, comment a little about the abyssal line and the knowledge's ecology, both concepts from the Portuguese scholar, okay, uh, Santo Souza, all right, and also a moment for you to have some comments and some questions, okay? Starting with this short history class, we can start with this picture, which is so-called discovery of Americas, but we can remember that it has been guided by religion. And in Europe, people were just passing through the moment of enlightenment in which we had this huge fight, this huge argument uh, between uh, religion and scientificism, science and the Cartesianism, the Cartesian thought. If we think of René Descartes as the main name of I think, therefore I am, we can remember someone who is thinking. So if you are not thinking, you are a savage, you are indigenous, you are a no one. Also, we can think of a difference between these two people, that the European people, they have organized their countries into nation states. So they have a universal and neutral idea of power, politics, and language. Otherwise, in the Americas, they, there, were, there wasn't any idea such as a nation state. There were many different peoples in their lives and tribes and all that, but they could not be compared. Uh, so the beginnings of capitalism are with the colonies exploitation. So if you think of Brazil as a colony and many other uh, countries in Latin America in general, we can think that their exploitation is the just beginning, the first uh, seeds of the capitalism as we know today. Uh, so thinking of modernity, the modern man is a result of the Eurocentric man, a man who is in the center of the world, a man who thinks the way, uh, uh, the way European people think. So this man is not a woman, is a man, is not any kind of man, it's an European man, and it's not any other man, but a Catholic man moved by religion, and it's not any kind of man, but a heterosexual man. So these uh, definitions, they are very specific when we talk about modernity. So we have a characteristic that defines a modern man, that is the hegemony and universality of this man. This man is universal. It is the mold of all things. If you can't think of any other kind of man, this is the center of all things. This is the European man. So when we have this civilization's first contact, this is what it comes. This is the big fight, the big argument of thoughts that we have in which they see the indigenous people as inferior people, as people who have not even understood the presence of God, who hasn't understood the presence of anything superior to them, anything like a nation state, a politician organization, or anything like this. Uh, so understanding that, we can see in the picture, we can see in the picture that we have a coin and we understand that modernity and colonialism, they are the same coin, though they are two sides. So they are two sides of the same 
coin, all right? So modernity and colonialism, they are always together. They are one thing. They are two sides of the same coin. So thinking of coloniality and colonialism, I brought two maps in which you can see the division that the Eurocentric uh, thought have made about the Americas and about Africa. And this division, it was compulsory. It was a division that was simply made by the Europeans themselves. Not only uh, no consults about the people who lived here, no ideas about the political structure of people who lived here, but only about their own ideas. So we have a central theme of concepts here, the difference between coloniality and colonialism. Colonialism is the historic process of starting to explore a colony and having its end. For example, in Brazil, when it came with independence in 1822. But coloniality is a process that persists to that because we still face the scars of the colonial process. For example, we still have problems with racism. And as you may see, the slavery process is really much related to colonialism. So the coloniality is not the historic process, but the scars that this colonial process has made to our society in general. So if people think that in our country, women are inferior, this is probably a result of the colonial process. This is coloniality. If we think that gay people should be murdered, it's because back in the days of colonial period, the model, the most important man, a superior man, was heterosexual, was straight, and they had the power to do what they wanted to gay people, and they wanted, they could kill and exterminate their race. The same happened uh, to the African, con the, the African continent. The same thing happened. They divided it as they wanted. And nowadays, we know that they face different kinds of problems, especially with relating to mapping, especially between peoples. They don't agree with this uh, divisions that the European countries made. For example, right now we are having a war in Ethiopia for about two years and people don't even know that, but we are facing a war. And the war is because there are two rival peoples who live there and they simply don't consider themselves living in the same country. So it's impossible to understand this origin of the conflict without going back to the colonial times. So this coloniality is nothing but the heritage that was taken from the colonial period. Continuing to think about that, we can start commenting about the coloniality. So as we understand what is uh, colonialism, we can think of what is to decolonize. What is then to decolonize is to start thinking of ways that go contrary to this movement, that go on the other way. So if we understand that we have, for example, as you see in the picture, uh, a black woman who is um, of course, an object of fetish for those white men that are represented over there. How can we change? Do we have anything similar today? Are black women still an object of fetish, for example? Though they are not dressed this way, though they are not uh, with their bodies shown, though they are not with an animal, like a snake, as you can see there, they are still a matter, they are still an object of fetish. What can we do to decolonize that? So I start thinking 
about a decolonial difference, as we have been talked uh, about the other. Who is the other? The Eurocentric thought thinks about the other as an inferior. The other is who is not me. And that what, that's what made them explore the colonies. And that's exactly what didn't make the indigenous peoples let them die when they got to the Americas. Because when they got here, when they started to get here, they were hungry. They were starving. They were going to die. And they don't, didn't even know what to eat, for example. If you want to have more uh, understanding about this, I suggest you to watch or read about uh, the most important leaderships of indigenous peoples in Brazil, like Ailton Krenak or Sonia Guajajara and others. Thinking about this difference, we can think of ethical questions, because this comes to ethics. The Moors were there. The European people understood who the Moors were. They were people who had a religion, but their religion was wrong. And then they faced the indigenous people. And for them, it's completely different than everything because these indigenous people, they don't have anything similar to their white perspectives because they already knew black people in Africa and they simply uh, branded these black peoples as slaves and people who didn't have a soul, people who needed to work to have to be free from their sins. Uh, and then they start to uh, get to Asia and see different uh, Asian peoples. And of course, we have whites. So these ethical questions comes when it means to raise. What is race when you think about this? Races is nothing but the other. According to the whites perspective, according to the Eurocentric perspective, anything that is not white is simply the other. And the other is not enough. It's not me, it's not important. It's because the white, remember the Cartesian thought, I think, therefore I am. The others are savages. The others, they don't think. So thinking of a decolonial process, a decolonial move, we can think of a transmodernity move. What would be that? Understanding that we don't have only one way of thinking, but a plurality of realities, many different ways of thinking. So Plural thinking is related to transmodernity. This idea of trans is exactly going beyond the modernity way of thinking. Remember, I just talked to you that modernity and coloniality, they are linked. They are the two faces of the same coin. But if you think in plural, if you think of transmodernity, how can we surpass this? We can start thinking of different critiques. So we start with Eurocentric critiques as the liberalism, Marxism, and post-structuralism as what we know nowadays in our academia and what people study mostly about the left-winged parties or Marxism and everything. But that comes only back in 2007, different ideas to go beyond this modernity and coloniality process. So we have El Hiro Descolonial from Castro Gomes and Gros Fogel that gives us a chance to think plurally, to think differently from what has been taught to us in modern times. To illustrate that, we have uh, this perspective of coloniality, and I put there three images. We have a concept of the coloniality of power that comes from Quijano 2000. Anibal Quijano gets this idea of power, projecting that the power that the white Eurocentric people have, it's as they are in the center of the world. As they are the man in the center, they can do whatever they want. So this picture of the coloniality of power is Greenwich. 
All right, Greenwich, as you guys know, is the time zone uh, landmark. It is right there to say here is the middle, right, the center of the world. Whatever comes, it's going to be a reference from Greenwich. So, for example, Brazil has three different time zones, like two, minus two, minus three, and minus four. All of them reference to Greenwich. So considering themselves uh, in the middle of the world, in the center of the world, means a lot. And this power does not only come there. This power goes way beyond because as they have the power, they can do whatever they want. As they have the power, they have also the power to enslave people or to kill indigenous tribes completely. They have the power of genocide and to kill and exterminate different uh, cultures and different uh, entire civilizations that we don't even know that lived hundreds and hundreds of years in the Americas. <clears throat> the second uh, example of coloniality, the second concept, is the coloniality of knowledge that is based on René Descartes' idea of, I think, In, in, but in straight lines. And this idea of thought, a universal thought that comes to different uh, perspectives, not of different men, but the same man is universal. It really much guides all of our uh, society's idea of knowledge. If it's not proof, though, if you cannot prove it, it's not science. So whatever is not Eurocentric, it's not knowledge. <clears throat> so we can think of it, for example, as, uh, for example, about the uh, different ways that people used to treat themselves back in the colonial period. And nowadays, people from pharmacies, they get this knowledge from people who live in the jungle, and they use this knowledge to cure many diseases. But understanding that their knowledge that goes to a laboratory, that goes to a different uh, scientific mode, that is science, that is knowledge. Otherwise, nothing else matters. Nothing else is knowledge. And another one is the coloniality of being. Uh, so as the man is in the center, the man is right. Uh, the measurement of all things, as you can see there, represented by the Vitruvian man of Leonardo da Vinci, you can understand that who is this man that is being pictured over there? It's a white man. It's not a woman, but a man. And of course, it has no religion. It is Catholic. It has no other religion. It is Catholic. So this kind of being is a superior being that has even defied God. But now it comes to the Americas. Who do you think they are going not to defy? They're going to defy everything. They can defy and they can win all of the other peoples who live there, all of the other gods who live there, and all the other peoples, entire civilizations who live there. For us to compare and think of it, I put here these different three images. The first one is the Ecuador line. So if, if we think of the center of the world in a line, of course, this line is figurative, this line is imaginary, this line is the Ecuador line that is right in between, right, the two hemispheres. And as you can see there, we have a tourist with the two legs open, like spread, one leg in the south and one leg in the north. That would be the middle of the world, the center of the world, not Greenwich. But this is not recognized as a center. It is not recognized, for example, to be the center or the time zone reference. Uh, on the second image, I put there a woman 
that is a quebradeira de coco that represents a movement of uh, very much what we see here in Piauí and in Maranhão that is about our knowledge. And if you talk to a woman like this one in the picture, you will see that she's not doing it uh, unpurposely. She knows what she's doing. It has a huge set of different instruments, a huge set of uh, instructions that she can give you. And of course, this is knowledge and it's not any kind of knowledge. It is our knowledge and this knowledge must be rewarded. This knowledge must be uh, understood as knowledge and not only disqualified as uh, it is used to be in the modern period. And also about the coloniality of being, we have seen the Vitruvian man all the time, but we have no idea who this man in the picture is. Not only because he is black, but because he is the leader of the Haiti revolution. His name is Jean-Jacques de Salines, but he was erased from history books. Our history books don't have this picture. And do you know why? Because he has led the first and most important slave revolution still back in the 18th century in Haiti. And this was a huge hit on the colonial movement, on the colonial part of the world. And they didn't want that to go spread to the other colonies. So this revolution was simply erased. If you think of it, uh, the Haiti colony, it was a colony from France. Today, they also speak French. Uh, Haiti was facing their problems with slavery and all, but when they had this revolution of theirs, they were, they were having their revolution while the French Revolution was taking place. So as you can think of it, the French Revolution is in every book. And we still know the dates and everything that goes with it. But we don't know what happened to the French colonies back then. As France was worried about their own problems, they could not face the revolutions that were happening inside their colonies. They could not suffocate the revolutions in the colonies. But one more time, as the coloniality of being, being... Uh, in American, being black as Jean-Jacques de Salines and being the leader of the Haiti revolution is not important enough to be, for example, in our history books nowadays. Well, thinking of it, we have the idea of the abyssal line that is, there was, this concept was uh, coined by Boaventura de Souza Santos, which is a Portuguese uh, citizen who says that abaixo da linha do Equador não há pecado. This idea comes with the colonial period. It is a coloniality scar that is about whatever happens in the South, and I mean global South, is no sin. You can do it and it's not a problem. So we have this binary thought of subalternation and the other. Who is the other? Is he a subaltern? Always. Because the white man is never a subaltern. In Grossfogel 2016 goes beyond that and creates the idea of being and non-being. If you are a being, it's because you have the rights. If we go back on what we were talking about the French Revolution, in the end of it, they created the rights for men. So we can think of it as freedom, fraternity, equality, and all that. But you only have these rights if you are a being. If you are not in this line, in this abyssal line, if you are in the other side of this abyssal line, you are a non-being. You are not a person. So you are invisible to society. And then we have many different ways to represent this non-being. We have neoliberalism nowadays. 
The gender is a very important factor. Race is also a factor. The period of eugenism was also very crucial to understand how people saw their different and they wanted to exterminate and cleanse these differences. We can think not only of Hitler and the Nazis as they wanted to exterminate the differences, but also we can think of uh, what comes here in Brazil as we had the integralist parties back in the 1940s, as we had uh, Monteiro Lobato in some of his uh, books and also with his payments because he was responsible for paying for many different experiments about eugenism. So this makes uh, what comes after the abyssal line invisible. And what is invisible is not a being, it's not important. So that's according to Boa Ventura de Souza Santos, what makes people not see their differences and create, for example, as we see today, a golden bowl in the middle of Sao Paulo, while there are many people going hungry. That's what makes these invisible people going hungry invisible, because they are not people. They are not enough to be people. Uh, that would be a difference to decolonize this abyssal line, to destroy this abyssal line, according to the, uh, the, the coloniality of knowledge, we would have on its opposite uh, the ecology of knowledges. So to surpass the abyssal line, according to Souza Santos 2007, we would break this relation to the other. How we can do that? By understanding that the other is another being just like us. And we, he or she can do whatever we can do. His or her ideas are as valid as ours. And that would end the hegemonic thought and the epistemicide. Understanding epistemicide as the killing of all different ways of knowledge. That way, we would have a surpassing of the abyssal line and the harmony of knowledges. In the end, we would have a hyperdiversity. That means different ways of diverse knowledges that would contemplate different perspectives of knowledges. That would be the concept of ecology of knowledges. And for us to think a little, I made this last slide so I can finish my speech about comments and questions, asking you to analyze this, quest, this image. Because when I put on Google images to uh, questions, the first thing that came was this image. It was a woman, not a man. It is a blonde woman, not any kind of woman. Why is that? Because when it comes to questions, why is that on Google that comes to a blonde woman? Why is always a blonde woman who has questions? That's what I want to ask you. Can we analyze this image from a different perspective? Why always that? because we have a stereotype, right? And the stereotype says that women are not as intelligent as men. Women, especially blonde women, they are the focus of bad jokes. And these jokes say that blonde women are not intelligent. Blonde women are dumb. So they are always going to have questions, okay? Decolonizing that would start from asking these questions. Why do I see that on Google Images, for example? Why is it the first thing that comes to Google Images when I make questions? And after that, thinking about it and interrogating that, identifying the problem and interrogating this problem, why does that happen? And finally, interrupting this, this cycle of injustice and inequality. 
okay? So we can analyze this image as many others in this context, okay? I would like to thank you all for being present and being attentious to my speech. It was a great honor, all right? And I'll give you some time so you can uh, ask questions or make comments to what I have presented. Thank you so much, dear Adrian for your excellent lecture. I have to say that we are really, really happy. It was an honor to hear you, to learn with you. And I hope everybody here had the same experience that I had. Okay, the, the images you use were really, like as we say, food for thought, okay, in English. So it's really, it make they make us think. I'd like to start um, first of all saying that we'd like to thank for people who are here watching us. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. As I've said before, as I've written before, questions can be asked in in English, in Portuguese. And I would dare Spanish, okay? <laughs> I don't know if I could translate from French, but like if you want to ask questions, uh, we can, maybe there are other people here who can help, okay? So please ask questions if you, if you want to. I'd like to start asking a question, okay? Um, one of the authors you used is Maldonado, right? And Maldonado, when he talks about the the being, when in one of his texts, he mentions that um, there is a there's a part of his book, uh, of a chapter I read, that is um, very, for me, very, very, very provoking, made me very, very sad, but it's something that I think we have to think. He says that uh, the for the black people, and we can, I think we can use that for other minorities, uh, when they the question for them is not like um, what rights do I have, but it's more why do I think I have rights? I have no rights. Okay, so this is really shocking, and I'd like you to comment briefly, if you could, please. How could teachers um, bring that? Okay, so bring the, 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 not only critical literacy, but bring the colonialism for their classes. Is it possible? How can teachers do that, please? Well, uh, thank you very much for your questions. And uh, I would like to start by telling a story that I just saw this morning. Uh, it was from a black man who was robbed and his car was stolen, right? His car was taken from him. Uh, two days later, uh, they found his car. Of course, his car was in a very bad condition because the, the people who got his car, right? They, they did what they wanted with the car and all that, but they found who were the robbers. And inside the car, they found some photos of the owner of the car even though the owner had his name on the car he had gone to the department uh to the the, the the legacy the police to talk about his car that has been robbed and you know, that has been stolen and all that uh one of the robbers said that his car was not only his but also the men's so the owner was arrested because he's black can you understand how is volatile this idea of having and not having rights it's really difficult to understand that people don't have the right to be or to have what they want or what they can have okay 
and understanding that, we can think of different ways to come to our classes with the colonial, the colonial ideas. For example, bringing a text, not necessarily something this shocking, but a text, for example, like the one that I showed with the image of a blonde woman full of interrogation marks, then, then we can comment about the image. Why does that, what does that have to do with question? Why do we always see a woman, a blonde woman with questions? Does that have anything to do with stereotypes? Can we use that in class? I really think we can. Uh, another possibility is showing what we have not seen in history. Like, what is that shown is that Eurocentric mode of thinking. If we think of this, we can show our students and make them understand by identifying, is there a problem here? Can you see it? Uh, can you identify anything different than what you expected here? And then we can, after identifying, interrogating this problem. Why is that so? And after that, we can interrupt this cycle. Do you think this kind of joke, for example, was it sexist? Was it uh, homophobic or something like this? It was, so it's not a good, a good thing to be done. So don't do it in real life situations, okay? I think this is a very good way of having it approached in our classes. Thank you very much for your answer. I think uh, it was really good, okay? Yes, I totally agree with you. These sexist things have to, and other, other um, prejudicial comments and prejudicial things we see in our society have to be raised in our classes in the, the discussions we have with our students. Adriano, our, our speaker um, has entered the link she was able to enter. So I'm going to, to leave here and you can talk to her, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, good morning. Okay, good morning, Professor Beckett. How are you? Good, good. Professor, we cannot hear you very well. It's very low. Mm -hmm. uh, your microphone is up. Like if you can, yeah. yes. Is it better? Much I... better, much okay. better. Didn't want to uh, shout. <laughs> okay. It's much better. It's much better. Well, okay. uh, now here in Brazil, it's 9.30. Okay. So we have, uh, I know you have an appointment in some minutes, right? But we still have like 30 minutes. So you can use this minutes uh, to share a presentation and, of course, to use uh, this time to speak. And, of course, as I uh, commented with you on the email, you have an audience and they can interact on the chat. Okay? Okay. Um, well, it looks like um, here it's 6.30. So... Um... I haven't read all your messages, but I see a lot of messages. It sounds like um, you thought it's an hour earlier or something. But in any case, my appointment here is um, at 8 o'clock our time. So I do have some time, but I have 30 minutes. Uh, Adriano, please. Okay, yes. I can use the 30 minutes. Uh. So... Um, I First of all, have... oops, sorry. Um, I just like I would like to welcome you, Dr. Guba Beckett, um, for your presence here, uh, Adriano Jalcantara. Please, just a moment, and I will let you speak. To introduce Dr. Beckett. Okay, maybe we misunderstand the the the, the time to to schedule a Google Meet. Maybe. But, <clears throat> okay, so just before you start your speech, uh, I would like to highlight that we are 
streaming this on YouTube. So oh, okay. Uh, okay. people are watching us on the channel of the oh, okay. language and literature graduate program at UFI. And you can interact with them with questions and we will let them know and they can ask you questions use the chat feature on youtube and we will let you know about the questions after your speech all right so okay so i have time... 20, 20 minutes to speak and then i we can have questions and answers after uh, uh, or because is it... we we may misunderstand the, the time for the start of the the lecture so adriano uh, he started he, his lecture just before you um, okay. because uh, it was in this time that we was waiting for you. Uh, we don't know <laughs> uh, what happened. So because he has just finished his speech, uh, he can introduce you and you okay. can present your lecture and you can speak up to 60 minutes, okay? So, uh, you, so don't worry about this. And after that, we will uh, open for questions uh, directed to your speech. And okay. people can also send questions to Adriano, okay, about his presentation. So Adriano, feel free to moderate this uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Beckett, for being present in our event. It's a great honor to host uh, this event and having your participation here. Well, Professor Gulbaha Beckett uh, had her master's degree in Queen's University and her PhD in the University of British Columbia. She is a professor of teaching English as a second language in applied linguistics. She focuses on project-based second and foreign language acquisition and socialization, uh, content-based second foreign language, uh, especially in English as a medium of instruction learning, uh, second in minority language policies, technology integrated teaching and learning, and academic literacy. She has numerous publications, including books, chapters, and articles in such journals as Review of Educational Research, uh, Language Policy, TISO Quarterly, The Modern Language Journal, The Canadian Modern Language Review, The English Language Teaching Journal, TESL, uh, Canada Journal, Journal of Research on Commuting in Education, Distance Education, Compare, a Journal of Comparative and International Education, Journal of Mixed Method Research and Applied Measurement in Education. She has also obtained various grants and fellowships, totaling over $2 million. Uh, additionally, she has chaired, supervised, numerous doctoral dissertations and master's thesis and projects. She is an associate editor of Diaspora, Indigenous and Minority Education Journals for Rotledge, and it's an honor to have her speech today here. Uh, Professor Beckett, feel free to speak. As Josivan has said, you have about 60 minutes, and I'm going to mediate your speech with questions and all that. Okay, thank you very much for the kind instruction. And I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of your conference. And um, I know Josewan because uh, part of those uh, $2 million grants um, has to do with Brazil. We have hosted uh, two cohorts of Brazilian teachers, uh, totaling over 25, 35. Uh, over 60 Brazilian teachers have come here to um, study with us. And of course, numerous Brazilian students before that. And we are hoping to um, host some more teachers. And uh, maybe some of you will be part of those and join us here. 
We have a wonderful university, beautiful campus, and uh, we would love to have you all to come work with us and study with us. Okay, so with that, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, I, uh, you are entering. You enter screen. Is that how I share? Okay. Yes, you have like an uh, arrow up, and then you hmm. click on it. It goes for a window. It's better if you you have a presentation open, right? Yes, I do. So you but, just a window, what, and you click okay. on the presentation. But what I see is us, not the presentation. Let me see. An arrow. You you may you oh, may I send see. your your presentation to our email. We can present it to you if Entire you wish. Entire screen window tab. Window. Ah, got it. Share. Okay, so I will talk um, from my presentation, uh, my slides, to get us, keep us organized, especially me, so that I don't talk too much. Um, so here's the um, title of the um, presentation that I sent you, and which I um, stuck to in preparation. So the title of the talk today is uh, Critical Thinking with Project-Based Learning and Why and How. So what I will do uh, is that um, I will first uh, talk about what critical thinking is and then I discuss why critical thinking is important and how we uh, engage our students and ourselves in critical thinking. And then I propose project-based learning as an ideal approach to do that, uh, which is to uh, engage our students and teach our students how to um, think critically. And then I will um, suggest uh, two project ideas as some examples to, for us to be able to do this. All right, now, so what is critical thinking? So as um, I pointed out in my uh, ILA presentation in August this year, and if you may know ILA, ILA is the uh, International uh, Applied Linguistics um, Congress. Um, so in my presentation there, this is what I said. That is, uh, critical thinking is a metacognitive process that we go through to decipher arguments and relationship between participants. Participants in any social activities, um, activity here, of course, the doing, um, um, uh, thinking on what activity is, and um, we use critical thinking to draw conclusions uh, between relationships, um, and we evaluate evidence um, and self-correct as we find necessary for main elements and assumptions based on the information provided to us. And this, of course, comes from colleagues' uh, work, such as Saxton and uh, et cetera. So critical thinking is, um, critical thinking is necessary skills uh, for, uh, again, interpretation, analysis, evaluation, and explanation by going beyond technical skills to solve problems. Um, okay, so critical thinking is often associated with um, 21st century um, skills, or it's seen as critical thinking is seen as one of the crucial skills necessary for 21st century um, teaching, learning, and functioning. Um, 
And this is along with other skills that are necessary for 21st century skills. Those are problem solving skills, communication, collaboration, and again, you see critical thinking and the digital competencies. And <clears throat> PBL refers to project based learning. Uh, you may know project based learning um, is uh, educational philosophical approach at, in envisioned by American progressive educational philosopher John Dewey. It's seen as an, um, the PBL is seen as ideally suited for uh, engaging students or ours and ourselves in, again, 21st century skills mentioned above. Because PBL is believed to and uh, has uh, proven to prove proven to be uh, able to promote deeper learning, especially in general education. Uh, we need to um, do more work on that in applied linguistics, but general education has utilized PBL, project-based learning, to do a lot of um, deeper learning, higher order thinking, etc. And especially recently with 21st century skills, there <clears throat> have been um, federal grants to um, establish project-based learning schools, whole school, project-based learning um, programs, and project-based learning has been um, utilized as a approach to engage whole state education system etc. So it's really important in general education and, and pre prevalent. But in applied linguistics, we need to do some more work, a lot of work, because work um, on critical thinking in applied linguistics is just beginning. So <clears throat> why critical thinking for applied linguistics? Um, applied linguistics field has gone through um, much progress, and we evolved. Uh, the the field has evolved, or we did, we too as uh, applied linguists evolved from doing form focused, teacher centered pedagogy, and conducting positivistic research, to including meaning focused, student centered pedagogy, and post positivistic research um, approaches. However, language materials and teaching are still largely form-focused, taught and assessed. Well, this is supposed to be assessed, okay. Taught and assessed through inauthentic tasks. Technology has been introduced into language teaching also, but often only utilized for superficial skills such as word processing. Uh, not superficial, but very basic. Well, yeah, basic, uh, <clears throat> basic needs of applied linguistics such as word processing, spelling, spell checking, and grammar checking. Um, while these are absolutely necessary, we need to utilize technology to do um, other uh, learning and teaching that um, engages engage students in higher order thinking. And we should be able to do that. And technology is capable of helping us do just that. <clears throat> but applied in applied linguistics, we haven't done enough of this yet. Okay, so what does this, um, uh, do all this have to do with, um, so what's the problem? Why do we need to do all that? So the problem is, <clears throat> as I mentioned, in general education, students engage in um, many more things than just learning language. They learn uh, their content areas, they learn higher order 
thinking skills, they learn other skills that are necessary to function in 21st century. Um, for themselves and for us, uh, students um, at all levels, including uh, children, uh, young children, are future of our society, of our world. And they deserve um, more than just learning a few words, learning correct grammar, making uh, correct sentences. And we need them to know those. We need them to be able to also to think. We need them to be able to use the correct grammar, uh, et cetera, to, to do better things. And, and uh, so for that reason, <clears throat> we need to engage um, our students, which is our English as foreign language or any language learners in also critical thinking. We need to teach them the language of critical thinking so that they can uh, uh, study, learn like their general education peers and help us, help us uh, move the society forward and function successfully in 21st century. So to reiterate, project-based learning, again, envisioned by Dewey uh, in general education is seen as um, ideally suited for, uh, for what I've been pr promoting and arguing for. And uh, <clears throat> that is what we can use in um, applied linguistics as well to promote critical thinking. So <clears throat> why is PBL um, seen as ideally suited to do what I said? Because PBL engages students in authentic learning. Uh, it can be designed uh, to uh, holistically um, engage students in sound pedagogy that are built, informed by, uh, with pedagogy with a sophisticated philosophical foundation. It helps us uh, scaffold <clears throat> the development of students' needs, um, helps us teach them disciplinary knowledge, intellectual language, help us um, scaffold them into uh, language intellectual and language development, again, critical and diverse thinking, and complex problem-solving skills um, experientially and interactively, again, as pointed out by Dewey almost 100 years ago. All right, uh, continuing on what is what PBL is. Um, as uh, my colleague Amy Walton and I pointed out in our in-press uh, chapter, project-based learning for um, second language learners <coughs> mean, uh, can mean that um, it's a Dubian sociocultural activity um, that teachers and students carry out to achieve various educational goals and by purposefully working on <clears throat> real world problems and creating knowledge in and out of schools. And PBL, project-based learning, can be a series of individual and group activities that involve language learning, content learning, through planning, researching, empirically or uh, document research, and analyzing and synthesizing the data that we uh, um, search for and find, and reflecting on the process and product <clears throat> uh, of um, the activity that we're engaging in, orally and in writing, by comparing, contrasting, and justifying alternatives. So that's why uh, the above definitions and reasons um, help us explain 
why PBL is crucial for um, a crucial and ideal approach to engage students in critical thinking. <clears throat> so, um, and additionally, PBL is um, consistent with Dewey'an and Halliday'an functional views of language, just in relation to applied linguistics. And it draws on language socialization theory uh, put forward by uh, professors Oakes and Schefflin in their anthropological work and then brought into the language socialization theory was brought into um, applied linguistics by uh, Patricia Duff at University of British Columbia. So the language socialization theory holds that we learn um, about language, uh, for example, linguistic knowledge, by engaging in sociocultural activities such as project work, by socializing with others, example, teachers and peers, and by using language while we are learning about our subject matter, <clears throat> engaging, uh, conducting our research for our project, um, and uh, discussing our work, content, work, knowledge, content and uh, processes of our project work with our colleagues and peers. So here are some sample projects that um, students in uh, my colleague um, Amy Walton's um, class, teacher education students, um, designed for their um, as, uh, assignments, major assignments for a course that she taught and currently I'm teaching um, <clears throat> um, in ESL literacy. So um, their projects included um, genealogy, helping tourists in Ho Chi Minh City, King Arthur. I know some of you uh, missed uh, some of you in, in literature, so you you would appreciate this. And there are also projects on things like daily routine, on culture, holidays, culture projects on cult cultural um, themes. Um, Conversational English can be content of, uh, of a project. Of course, a project on studying film. <clears throat> Dinosaurs, of course. And um, even things like Yu-Gi-Oh, information literacy, um, endangered animals, especially now that we are in climate change context, etc. So in case, <clears throat> by this time, in case you're wondering what are some practical project ideas. So these teacher education students designed these projects for their <clears throat> uh, teaching context, such as high school, um, for example, Vietnamese adult ESL class, um, which you can relate as in for your EFL classes in Brazil. I, I know that some of you are high school teachers to so teach English there, so should uh, be able to relate to this as well. Middle school, elementary school, <clears throat> conversational English. How is <clears throat> you can do a project on that for intensive English um, students, etc. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So back to uh, linking um, project work, uh, project-based learning <coughs> to or with 21st century skills domains. Uh, domains. <coughs> Quantifile uh, 2016 is an extensive review of uh, project-based um, research and pedagogical literature. <clears throat> that, based on that literature review, Codifile uh, identified these domains 
for 21st century skills, which can uh, which um, project based work claim to um, claimed to have been able to do. And those are <clears throat> cognitive domain. Um, cognitive domain um, covers competencies related to thinking skills, reasoning, problem solving, um, and memory. Uh, this domain also includes content knowledge and creativity. So uh, examples of these um, competencies, um, more specific examples include academic content skills, again, critical thinking, technology literacy, active listening, problem solving, creativity. And also uh, interpersonal domain um, that has to do with uh, affective competencies. Um, that is necessary, a competence, affective competencies that are necessary or used to um, achieve one's uh, personal goals. And specific examples include self-regulation, <clears throat> metacognition, grit, um, flexibility, etc. These are the skills that we also need to teach and that um, PBL can do, help us do that. Interpersonal skills, uh, competencies and um, used to express, interpret, and react to information. And we need, and that examples include communication, collaboration, conflict resolution, leadership, etc. So again, to reiterate, uh, based on, uh, I think it was, a, yeah, one decade, because there was one more before this a decade of um, research and pedagogical um, work on PBL, Codifile um, identified these as uh, domains that can uh, be covered with project-based learning approach. OK, so PBL then can address uh, all of these uh, uh, domains. Um, however, um, a team of um, students here, uh, graduate students, uh, mostly PhD students, and myself have been um, re reviewing, uh, engaging in, um, or conducting a systematic review of um, project-based learning research published between 1980 to 2020. And to date, we found uh, 577 such articles. And of course, we are limited to the ones that are published in English. So we've been um, um, systematically going through those articles and entering data uh, for various domains and themes to see what has been addressed. And critical thinking was uh, one of the um, domains that we wanted to see how, who, how much, and um, how uh, has um, critical thinking been addressed in PBLL, this is project-based language learning research during the past 40 years. What we found <clears throat> is that almost every article uh, claimed that uh, PBL does critical thinking. It's good for critical thinking, that we need project-based learning to engage students in critical thinking. But in reality, <clears throat> when we go deeper into the articles to see, OK, so how did they actually you do uh, um, address critical thinking specifically? Uh, we found only 11, only 11 out of uh, uh, 577 articles actually, specifically, <clears throat> did something about critical, 
critical thinking. The rest of them just said that it does and didn't really address it. Address it. So this uh, confirms my earlier argument for applied linguistics to engage uh, students or do more work on critical thinking and address this in general. <clears throat> um, so how do we do this? Um, of course, you would want to know by this time that, yes, you're convinced that uh, critical thinking is absolutely necessary and that um, language students deserve uh, to learn to be critical thinkers, <clears throat> just like their general education peers, for themselves and for us to help us move the society, uh, the world, uh, to a better place together and because and also uh, by themselves in the future and they are our future. So you are also convinced by now hopefully that project-based learning is the way to do it. Now you are probably wondering what are some examples of projects in addition to the ones that I uh, showed you from uh, my colleague Amy Walton's class that can engage students in critical thinking. Okay, so <clears throat> here <clears throat> I um, propose two uh, project ideas, one of which I actually presented in my, uh, uh, mentioned in my ILA presentation, <clears throat> and I'm continuing the work on this with my students here, and uh, partic in particular with one who is a corpus studying to be a corpus linguist. So we want to see how we can utilize corpus linguistics to do an um, um, even better job <clears throat> on critical thinking. So I mentioned that's why 2020, back in 2021. Um, so here are some ideas that um, I have for doing critical thinking. <clears throat> was uh, one project idea that I'm calling here COVID-19 vaccination hesitance uh, social media project. <clears throat> so here's uh, what can be done. Here are some things that can be done uh, with such project in relation to critical thinking. And um, I think this vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine hesitation, hesitance, <clears throat> seems to be a um, <clears throat> worldwide problem. Problem. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm already taking sides. Uh, am I not by calling it problem? <clears throat> but anyways, it seems to be a, a topic of discussion uh, worldwide for those of us who have choice to uh, hesitate, uh, to oppose, or to accept, etc. So um, I think this is an ideal topic for one ideal topic to engage students into critical thinking. For instance, we can design a project on COVID hesitance um, uh, on social media. Specifically, we can ask students to go explore who's hesitating and why are they or are we hesitating and what's being said about um, <clears throat> vaccines or which vaccine in particular, by whom perhaps to con that may have contributed to the hesitancy. And um, we can ask students to also go find out how are these hesitancies um, being discussed on <clears throat> social media? And where are these uh, discussions uh, taking place? And this question has to do with, uh, I'm, I myself am not on too many social media platforms, but what I hear from my students and my children 
uh, is that, and from uh, watching news, that apparently there are platforms that are um, specifically catered to people with different ideologies. So knowing which platform the discussion is taking place, by whom, in what ways, and linking that to those who are hesitating can help us um, think critically to see, oh, it's this site um, that promotes such and such ideology that through such and such um, factual or non-factual information and whose research findings are being discussed here? Is it, um, for example, for us, these uh, um, you, U.S. CDC, uh, is it Dr. Fauci's uh, um, thoughts uh, uh, that's, that's on? Or are the thoughts of uh, Dr. Walensky, the CDC director's uh, thoughts are uh, being discussed? Or is it just anybody's thoughts, neighbors, somebody we've never heard of? Or does the person who uh, provide information have um, scientific training? Or again, or is it somebody that um, just heard some gossip, etc., that are who are influencing the discussion and therefore contributing to hesitancy? And we can ask students to uh, find out, are there any alternative thoughts provided on this platform? Or is it all uh, about the same people, the same thoughts, and um, there is no alternative facts provided there aren't any um, different ideology uh, or people from different parties, for example? or real journalists that are reporting, etc. So then, <clears throat> as I um, pointed out earlier, we can have students compare what they found, contrast their thoughts, analyze their thoughts, uh, argue for and against, uh, uh, propose their uh, findings, and propose alternatives, and um, and then come to class reporting their findings uh, through oral presentation and also writing it up uh, as a um, written assignment. Of course, um, another um, pressing um, topic of discussion currently is climate change. <clears throat> um, Technology, climate change project with technology. With technology, because technology allows us to research um, climate change issues, discussions, and um, facts and happenings uh, worldwide, and at least the world, the countries where we can reach with technology. <clears throat> so for this kind of project, we can ask students to explore, again, reports using technology to see what's happening to climate change. What, well, first of all, find out what is climate change. What's happening as a result of climate change? There are floods going on by in Canada, for instance, in, in West Coast, where <clears throat> I went to school. There's been huge flood that um, um, is devastating. Yes, so those are some of that, for example, is one result of climate change, which we can ask the kind of <clears throat> happenings that we can ask students to find out. We can also ask students <clears throat> in their further projects to find out what's being done about climate change. Well, of course, we just had a COP21 or something. The world leaders, willing leaders, went um, along, came together to <clears throat> discuss what to do and came up with uh, uh, some uh, plans at least, right? And um, how else should we <clears throat> react to climate change? What are some timelines necessary that we should set, uh, set up for solving um, 
climate change problems and saving the earth and why, etc. And we can then, how should climate change be discussed and why, again, alternative thoughts, etc., etc. So these are, this is another uh, good project example for um, engaging students in um, critical thinking. All right. So, <clears throat> while doing that, uh, remember that, um, recall that I also said earlier that we need to teach students critical thinking and also language of critical thinking so that um, we can teach language and content simultaneously. Be, um, in reaction to <coughs> the um, weakness or inadequacy of the formal approach to language teaching, which is we teach language first and then teach them skills and then teach them uh, content knowledge, etc. What I'm arguing for is that let's do all of those simultaneously so that we um, give students uh, what they deserve sooner and better. And one of the sooner and better uh, ways of doing that is to teach uh, the language of what um, it, the language of skills and language of content. For instance, in relation to critical thinking, the two projects that projects that I just proposed, um, vaccine hesitancy and climate change, the uh, social studies content projects, right? So um, with those projects, if we engage students in, in critical thinking, what we must not forget to also do is to teach them the language of critical thinking. And because we are language teachers, right, also. And uh, we can look to um, the appraisal framework um, within applied lingua uh, within systemic functional uh, linguistics. Appraisal framework, of course, is put forward by Jim Martin and colleagues, and there's been a lot of work. And it's currently, um, it's becoming uh, very popular because we are in applied linguistics are doing a lot of appraisal, uh, critical thinking and work. So um, this is uh, Beckett 2021. Again, I'm referring to, um, uh, the talk that I gave at ILA in August. So um, specific examples of, uh, well, there's so much that can be done, but I'm just giving you some examples to uh, get you started on thinking about how to do this. So uh, examples of critical thinking language uh, related to affect, for example, like, dislike, security, insecurity, Again, in relation to vaccine, climate change. Um, language of judgment, specifically uh, vocabulary such as honest, dishonest, even though these look like just a few words, but they come loaded with evaluative um, uh, nature, right? Honest, dishonest, the minute we see them, we know that it's, somebody's evaluating something liking, disliking, feeling secure, feeling insecure, right? Competent, incompetent, related to vaccine hesitancy. They probably, the discussions include things like, oh, this incompetent scientists, yeah, yeah, that. And incompetent governments, they are not able to tell us um, why we should even take the vaccines. Usually you would see this. So we can teach language to students as language teachers while we are also teaching critical thinking and with this uh, in mind. We can teach them language of appreciation, for example. Those who are not hesitating, perhaps uh, say, use language such as, wow, Pfizer vaccine is just impressive. Somebody else might say Moderna is even more impressive, while compared to whatever other brands as it's disappointing. Somebody may say something like, well, I'm hesitating because uh, the research is inconclusive on this. 
or that somebody might say, well, I think I have conclusive uh, uh, research that I've read, etc. Then we can teach students language of graduation, which is how intensely they are liking something or how intensely that they're opposing something. And even just, uh, <clears throat> but again, by just looking at words such as, this is, I'm feeling vulnerable, for instance, right? Um, people feel threatened by the extreme uh, weather change, or climate change and weather phenomenon. And uh, we feel that we are endangered, that animals are endangered uh, by all this flood and fire that went on <clears throat> and is still going on. Some of these animals may become extinct because of landslide and, and again, fire and et cetera. So there are, my, again, to reiterate, my point is that there are ways that to teach critical thinking and language of thinking through these. These are just some examples of what are the languages, features that can go with critical thinking and how we categorize them to help us organize ourselves and then teach students what to do. Okay, here's uh, uh, something that I found um, and also included in my ILA talk. It's a <coughs> table of um, domains, questions, and examples put together by um, uh, yeah, by a, a site, um, of course, a group of people that have a site called Global Digital Citizen uh, Foundation. They put together this, and I, of course, uh, modified it a little to um, suit uh, my need on discussing critical thinking. So, of course, we ask, my, my point is that here's another way of doing this and, and frame um, the, uh, what I talked about earlier, the language and the thoughts within these frames. For instance, we discuss what, <clears throat> need to know who, why, where, when, how. And here are some examples that, uh, for instance, what's the problem? What's the issue about COVID vaccination, right? And uh, what are the evidence for support, argument against? And again, who's doing the reporting? Who's opposing? Who's accepting? And what are some uh, negative impacts? Are they scientifically um, or positive efficacy? Are they scientifically presented, citing research? And uh, why um, these problems are being discussed? Is it um, to promote the pharmaceutical um, companies or is it to really uh, to help solve problem for people and et cetera, et cetera. Are there any alternative arguments to help people make their mind uh, in educated manner? Again, as I said before, where are these uh, discussions and reports uh, um, posted? And when was this published? Uh, is, is it are people using a um, report from the early days of vaccine when we actually really did not know uh, the efficacy and still using old information to make decision? Or is the information up to date? Uh, is it from uh, a year-long research just published that we know for sure now that it's OK, et cetera? All right, so I'm just providing a, a framework examples to uh, say that here's how we can do it. Okay, so why technology? And in both um, uh, examples, I said that we should incorporate technology into PBL, project-based learning. So this is last slide. <clears throat> so, so why technology, language, and other domains? Because just like PBL, technology has been um, uh, touted as um, the biggest and the best thing um, that happened to uh, mankind or people kind. And um, 
but it has been underutilized for purposes for higher order thinking. To reiterate what I said earlier, while we tout how good technology is, well, of course it's good. Like for example, it can help us do stuff, things like this. I'm giving a talk to you while you're sitting in Brazil and while I'm here in the USA. So of course it's, it's great. Uh, but in applied linguistics, we have not been able, we haven't uh, used, utilized technology to do even more things such as higher or teaching students uh, higher order thinking with technology. So that's why I'm calling that uh, we utilize technology to uh, teach critical thinking, problem solving, not just spell checking, grammar checking, and also not, not just uh, hooking up to the computer and give talks. So the technology tool in itself uh, should help us help students learn better, is what I'm saying. Um, so, um, and um, lastly, what I'm also saying is that, um, as we saw in Codifile's um, domains, and the Digital Citizens uh, Group put together framework, which um, I just uh, modified a little, and the project ideas that I proposed, and using the appraisal um, framework um, and technology, what I'm saying is that we can <clears throat> engage in much more sophisticated language education for our students and for our field. So that is the end of my, my uh, talk, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor <laughs> Bannett. Uh, feel our warm applause. I know that in presidential uh, speeches, we have this time of applause. Unfortunately, oh. <laughs> on remote, <laughs> we don't have it, but feel it as if we okay. are applauding. All right. Uh, it was a great honor to have Did your talk uh, to us. All right. Uh, people who are... <laughs> Thank yes, you. Yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, people who are participating on the chat, feel free to ask questions, to make comments. I see that a lot of people are congratulating you, saying that it was excellent and that they are going to utilize... Uh, the ideas to incorporate in their classes, and this is very important, right? And for us to start with the comments and the debates, I would like I myself to start with a question because uh, I am really much concerned <clears throat> about the supervision of the activities. Mm. What uh, tips could you give to supervise the activities using the project-based learning, especially when we are dealing with technolog technological uh, instruments as we are right now? Yes, very good question. Our systematic review of literature also revealed that uh, teachers need to be trained. In fact, students also need to be trained because PBL, while it's been in practice, uh, in general education for over, uh, yeah, kind of over a hundred years now, a little over. In applied linguistics, this is still new. And also applied linguistics, um, in applied linguistics, most of us still are used to teaching everything bits in bits and pieces. Let's go teach a few vocabulary, let's do a few grammar teaching and etc. So we are not a lot of people are not used to teaching language, teaching thinking, teaching content knowledge, or, and this technology, these are a, a lot for a lot of people. So yeah, so that's legitimate question. So how do you want me to do this? So many things together. So we do need to teach, um, teach teachers, train teachers to use technology, train teachers, um, uh, on how to um, 
conduct project-based learning? Okay, so I know your question is that how? Um, so the way that uh, we've been training teachers is I, my colleague Amy Walton and myself, for instance, we just teach our students. We set aside four or five weeks uh, in the semester and just teach them about um, the four or five weeks uh, about teaching them about how to, what is project-based learning, how to design a project, and how to implement project. And by that time, they will have learned about technology, about assessment, until the, the fi last five uh, weeks. So then we show them how the technology that the tools that they've learned so far can be integrated into PBL. And until the last five weeks, my, my students, for instance, also learned how to teach, again, uh, grammar, um, listening, uh, reading, speaking, writing across the curriculum, et cetera, separately. So the last five weeks is that I constantly say, OK, so what did we learn in chapter four about teaching reading? Blah, blah, blah. OK, so how can we integrate that into uh, holistic learning uh, into PBL? So it's more or less training them and scaffolding them into their other knowledge that they learned elsewhere into uh, uh, doing teaching those within PBL context. So it, yeah, we need to train. And um, teachers actually know a lot of technology. We just need to help them, train them to pull all of those together. So um, if you come to ISU was as part of the um, next, and the next, next cohorts of the uh, PDPI <clears throat> that, that we have, um, you get trained on that here. So yeah, it can be done. And when it's done, uh, I actually just had this with my students yes, yesterday, last yeah, evening, actually. They understood, and they can do it. I can see the bright-eyed and happy students who were able to see, oh, this is how you put all of those. Uh, bits and pieces together and actually teach it in context meaningfully. So why do we need gra good grammar? Why do we need to write well? It's to tell, do research, and find out what we can do, and then present our um, work in writing and, and um, orally. So it can be done, but, but teachers need to be trained on this, yes. And we are, applied linguistics is way behind on this. And it, even though it's a bit of work, we must do this. It's, um, uh, as I often say to my students, when it's easy, we of course do it. But everybody does easy things. And just because it's uh, more complex doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It's the more complex it is, the more we need to do it. Because again, our students deserve that. Otherwise, uh, I'd say we're not doing our job by teaching them bits and pieces. So, yeah. Very nice, very nice. I totally agree on that, right? Thinking that teachers in general know a lot about technology, but Understanding how to use it yeah. to teach, that's a different thing, right? Yeah. That's a different thing. <clears throat> yeah, we need to train them. And I, I said that you can come here to be trained, but of course, we can also do it. Speaking of technology, we can train teachers digitally and through technology. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So Professor one more question, and then I'll go to my other <laughs> appointment. <laughs> yes. So we have one. It's like not a question, but a request for you to please share the the references for your okay. presentation, right? Okay. 
so we can uh, debate later. And there is a question here from one of the professors of the language department. Professor Vanya asked, so how do you differentiate critical thinking and critical literacy? Or how close are these two approaches? Also, hmm. how about multimodal literacy? Ah, uh, project-based learning is definitely definitely multimodal, especially the way that I presented. See it. <clears throat> so, critic. What's the difference between critical thinking and critical literacy? Um, critical thinking is integral part of critical literacy, and um, the the projects that I just um, um, proposed <clears throat> need uh, to, to train students on critical thinking definitely requires critical and also uh, engage uh, teaches students critical literacy. Critical literacy to my knowledge includes also include multimodality, thinking critically, um, yeah, they're, into, they're very related, yes. If anything, I'd say that critical literacy is a larger field of study. Critical thinking is part of critical literacy. Very nice, very good. Well, thank you very much, Professor Beckett, for your presence, for your brilliant speech. I am sure that it has provoked a lot the, the people who are uh, watching, people who are uh, being part of it. And we are really much thankful for your beautiful and brilliant words. Okay, so I would like to thank everyone who has participated on the chat, who has watched, people who have participated. And I would like Professor Beckett to wait a little bit more so we could speak a little outstaged, okay? So thank you very much and have a very good event. This is just the beginning. We are going to have a very good and productive afternoon. And tomorrow we also have a lot of things on our event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'll sign out and then I'll go okay. to the meeting. I'll just uh, end the, the streaming on YouTube. And after that, we can talk uh, without being aired on there. Okay. Thank you.